there are really two big questions in biology. How do you get new living forms with new structures like wings and eyes from life that already exists? And secondly, how did life originate on Earth in the first place? Now, of course, we know that Darwin spent most of his life formulating an answer to the first of these two questions. Charles Darwin compared the history of life on Earth to a great branching tree. The base of the tree represented the very first living cell, and the branches were new and more complex life forms that had evolved over time from the first primitive organism. Darwin was trying to explain how the branches on the tree of life originated. He was trying to show how natural selection could have modified existing organisms to produce the great diversity of plant and animal life that fills the earth today. But when it came to the base of the tree, which represented the origin of the first life, the first living cell, Darwin had very little to say. In fact, in The Origin of Species, he didn't even address the question of how life might have originated from non-living matter. The only glimpses we have of Darwin's opinions on the subject appear in a letter he wrote to a colleague named Joseph Hooker. Regarding the first production of a living organism, if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat and electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present, such matter would be instantly devoured. But this may not have been the case before living creatures were formed. During the final years of his life, Darwin did little to develop his idea that a primitive cell might have emerged from simple chemicals in the primordial waters of the early Earth. But later in the 1920s and 30s, a Russian scientist named Alexander Oparin formulated a detailed theory about how this could have happened. It was called chemical evolution. Oparin thought that he could explain the origin of the first life using Darwinian principles. He envisioned simple chemicals combining and recombining to form larger molecules and then these larger molecules organizing themselves with the help of chance variations and natural selection into the first primitive living cell. Over the next three decades, many scientists worked to develop and refine these ideas as they pondered the questions both Oparin and Darwin had raised. How could life have evolved from simple chemicals? One man thought he knew. The problem of biological origins has, for a very long time, I would say, has been a real deep interest to me just because of the scale of the problem, the importance of it. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what are, why are we here? Uh, all that kind of uh, question. Uh, probed from the point of view of natural science. During the late 1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, Dean Kenyon was one of the leading chemical evolutionary theorists in the world. And like others in this field, he was trying to explain how life on Earth began through a purely natural process. In 1969, Kenyon co-authored an important book on the origin of life. Gary Steinman and myself thought that uh, if we were to pull together um, in uh, all of the uh, lines of empirical uh, evidence that had accumulated by the uh, mid to late uh, 60s in one continuous uh, argument, we were very enthusiastic about the possibilities uh, for explaining uh, the origin of the main life-building elements. Despite his optimism, Kenyon faced a significant problem. To explain how life began, he first had to account for the origin of the essential building blocks of every cell that has existed on Earth. Large, complex molecules called proteins. Proteins have a wide range of function in the cell, everything from structural requirements in terms of scaffolding of the cell, the cytoskeleton, to enzymes where they're actually processing molecules to harvest energy or to build components of the cell. 
proteins do pretty much all of the jobs inside of the cell, except for storing genetic information. That's left to the DNA, the RNA. But all the day-to-day -day jobs, cleaning up the cell, making energy, it's all proteins. Kenyon knew that proteins would have been as important to the first life as they are to living cells today. He also recognized the complexity of their construction. By the 1960s, scientists had determined that even simple cells are made of thousands of different types of proteins. And the function of these molecules derives from their highly complex three-dimensional shapes. The irregular shapes of some proteins allow them to catalyze or trigger chemical reactions because of the hand and glove fit that they have with other molecules in the cell while other protein molecules form interlocking structural components. The individual parts of a bacterial motor, like this ring structure, are each made of either a single protein molecule or an assembly of proteins fitted together into a specific shape. These proteins are, in turn, made of smaller chemical units called amino acids that are linked together in long chains. There is a very great degree of intricacy of architecture down in the uh, cell units in these protein-forming amino acids. In nature, 20 different types of amino acids are used to construct protein chains. Biologists have compared them to the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Alphabetic letters can be arranged in a huge number of possible combinations. And it's the sequential arrangement of the letters that determines whether you have meaningful words and sentences. If the letters are arranged correctly, you'll get meaningful text. But if they're not arranged correctly, you'll get gibberish. And the same principle applies for amino acids and proteins. There are at least 30,000 distinct types of proteins, each made of a different combination of the same 20 amino acids. They are arranged, like letters, to form chains, often hundreds of units long. If the amino acids are sequenced correctly, then the chain will fold into a functioning protein. Proteins are arranged with their amino acids in such a way that the amino acids collapse on each other into an architecture that is pre-programmed by the order of the amino acids it folds into a certain structure and that structure can do a certain function. So all proteins in the cell have a certain three-dimensional pattern that's based on the arrangement of amino acids in the chain. This arrangement is critical. For if the amino acids are incorrectly sequenced, a useless chain forms and instead of folding into a protein, it will be destroyed in the cell. Proteins, like written languages or computer codes, have a high degree of specificity. The function of the whole depends upon the precise arrangement of the individual parts. Back in the days of Charles Darwin, relatively little was known about uh, the complexity, the enormous complexity of the microscopic world, the microscopic aspects of, of living organisms. Uh, there was a view that uh, in the 19th, uh, latter part of the 19th century that a living cell was essentially a, a featureless bag of enzymes, all kind of in, in true solution, not much uh, in, in the way of uh, detailed uh, three-dimensional complexity. Um, but of course, in the 20th century, we've made enormous strides in understanding that that's not the case at all. There is a, a very great degree of intricacy of architecture down in these cell units. So today everybody understands uh, about bits and bytes and so perhaps a useful illustration there of the uh, complexity, let's say, of the uh, DNA molecules might be helpful. You can calculate the number of bits contained in tightly packed um, uh, DNA material, let's say, that would fill one cubic millimeter of space as equaling 1.9 times 10 to the 18th power bits. Now that number is, by many orders of magnitude, vastly greater than the storage capacity 
of the largest uh, computing machines that we have, the uh, supercomputing machines. Their storage capacity per cubic millimeter is far less than the information storage capacity in the, uh, in the DNA molecule. Now, moreover, the DNA itself, as it functions in a living cell, has a, about a hundred different proteins involved with just its own functioning. And uh, then you have these tens of thousands of other proteins in the rest of the, of the living uh, uh, cell also involved. So we have now a picture of immense submicroscopic complexity. And so it no longer is a reasonable proposition to think that simple chemical events could have any chance at all to generate the kind of complexity that we see in the very simplest living organism. So uh, we have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells now with, uh, with the new knowledge that's accumulated in this century. In living cells today, chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins. It is called DNA. Initially, Kenyon believed that proteins could have formed directly from amino acids without any DNA assembly instructions. And, and that's why so many scientists were excited about his theory. But the more he and others learned about the properties of amino acids and proteins, the more he began to doubt that proteins could self-assemble without DNA. In DNA, Kenyon encountered a molecule with a property he could not explain through natural processes. For locked securely within its double helix structure is a wealth of information in the form of precisely sequenced chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G. In a written language, information is communicated by a precise arrangement of letters. In the same way, the instructions necessary to assemble amino acids into proteins are conveyed by the sequences of chemicals arranged along the spine of the DNA. This chemical code has been called the language of life, and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Like other scientists working on the origin of life, Kenyon realized he had two choices. Either he had to explain where these genetic assembly instructions came from, or he had to explain how proteins could have arisen directly from amino acids without DNA in the primordial oceans. And in the end, he realized he could do neither. It's an enormous problem how you could get together in one tiny submicroscopic volume of the primitive ocean all of the uh, hundreds of different molecular components you would need in order for a self-replicating cycle to be established. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached uh, I guess for me the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon reevaluated his theory new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. The more I conducted my own studies including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory, and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. The more I thought about the alternative that was being presented in the criticism and the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding uh, regarding origins 
For Dean Kenyon, a new question became the focus of his search for life's origin. What was the source of the biological information in DNA? If one could get at the origin of the uh, messages, the encoded messages within the living machinery, then you would really be on to something far more intellectually satisfying than this chemical evolution theory. Yet Kenyon realized that he faced a narrowing set of options. By the 1970s, most researchers had rejected the idea that the information necessary to build the first cell originated by chance alone. To understand why, consider the difficulty of generating just two lines of Shakespeare's play Hamlet by dropping Scrabble letters onto a tabletop. then considered that the specific genetic instructions required to build the proteins in even the simplest one-celled organism would fill hundreds of pages of printed text. Of course, a serious origin of life biologists did not believe that life had arisen by chance alone. Instead, they envisioned natural selection acting on random variations among chemicals to produce the first life. But there was a problem with this proposal. By definition, natural selection could not have functioned before the existence of the first living cell. For it can only act upon organisms capable of replicating themselves. Cells equipped with DNA that pass on their genetic changes to future generations. Without DNA, there is no self-replication. But without self-replication, there is no natural selection. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization had all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, Science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. 
These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. When I look at molecular machines or the incredibly complex process by which cells divide, I want to ask, is it possible that these things had an intelligence behind them, that there was a plan or a purpose to this structure? Science ought to be a search for the truth about the world. Now we shouldn't prejudge what might be true. We shouldn't say, I don't like that explanation so I'm going to put it to one side. Rather, when we come to a puzzle in nature, we ought to bring to that puzzle every possible cause that might explain it. One of the problems I have with evolutionary theory is it artificially rules out a kind of cause even before the evidence has a chance to speak. And the cause that's ruled out is intelligence. Since the late 19th century, since the time of Darwin, in fact, in part because of Darwin's writing in The Origin of Species, scientists came to con accept a convention a definition of science that excluded the possibility of design as a scientific explanation. And that convention has a name. It's called methodological naturalism. And it just means that if you're going to be scientific, you must limit yourself to explanations that invoke only natural causes. You can't invoke intelligence as a cause. And yet, curiously, we make inferences to intelligence all the time. It's part of our ordinary reasoning to recognize the effects of intelligence. Consider, for example, these hieroglyphic messages carved upon the ruins of Egyptian monuments. No one would attribute the shapes and arrangements of these symbols to natural causes, like sandstorms or erosion. Instead, we recognize them as the work of ancient scribes, intelligent human agents. Similar reasoning leads us to conclude that the mysterious stone figures on the shores of Easter Island were not formed by the actions of wind and water over great periods of time. Nor do we presume that plants could grow into these familiar shapes without some manner of intelligent guidance.